inside of our page objects. And uh, we can't pre-allocate uh, objects to describe the page. And even if we could, uh, we wouldn't want to because we could have a thousand items in our list. And who wants to spend time waiting for a thousand items to be pre-allocated when we're probably only going to look at one or two of them, right? What we're really looking for is an easy way to uh, an easy way to access items in the list, and uh, we can do that two ways. We can either access items in the list sequentially, or we can uh, do a search and uh, and and look for items in a non-sequential manner. So before we can uh, talk about how to build a page object for a list. Uh, we should first investigate how do we use lists. So lists tend to have uh, some kind of metadata around them. And this metadata helps users understand uh, what, how to, it helps users uh, interpret the information that is in the list. So metadata includes things like how many items are in the list or what are the headers for the list. Also, lists uh, tend to pr uh, provide back to the user a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a common uh, structure. So the items in the list are usually uh, structured very similarly. We don't have uh, uh, lots of different types of uh, items being returned back. They all pretty much look the same. They have uh, the same uh, fields within them, and, uh, and there's a countable number of items. So we don't get an infinite number of items back. We can count them. We can iterate through them. Generally, we like to be able to uh, read the information in a list. That, uh, that makes, makes it easier if we're uh, trying to find a particular value or a particular item in the list. We can read the list or read items in the list. And lastly, we like to be able to interact with the items in the list. So what I mean by interact with them, list items are, uh, are just summaries of results that are provided back to the user. And usually there uh, there's, might be a link or something in that list item. And if we click on that link, we can get more detail about the item that's being uh, summarized in the list. So I'd like to introduce to you a, uh, a, a pattern called the item list pattern. And uh, it encourages the users to think about the uh, problem of building page objects for lists of items uh, using two uh, participant classes a container class, and an item class. So in this pattern, we use uh, the iterator pattern uh, to help uh, enumerate items. We use something called template locators. And then we also use another uh, design pattern called the factory method pattern. So we'll start off by uh, looking at uh, what is, uh, uh, I guess, what is a container. So the container class provides uh, has two main responsibilities. The first responsibility is that it provides access to the list metadata. Right? So these are things like uh, uh, how, many, how many items are in the list. The second responsibility of the container class is that it gives us access to items in the list. It doesn't tell us anything about particular items in the list. It just lets us have access to, uh, to a particular item. The item class, on the other hand, represents a single item in the list. So if you're looking, if you want to query the item, you would get an item class object, and, uh, and you can ask that item, what is your value? And uh, it would also be nice if that item class could uh, be switched to represent another item in the list without creating a new object, right? Because that way we can uh, quickly uh, go through the list. All right, so what we'll describe is, uh, is an abstract container class and an abstract item class. And then from the container and the item class, we'll create uh, two concrete classes uh, that, that actually implement uh, a list. So the container class, as I mentioned before, it has two main goals. Uh, or responsibilities. The first responsibility is that it lets, allows the user to access list metadata. So uh, one of my favorite questions to ask a container is, how many items do you think are in the list? Right? Uh, usually on the website, there's a, there's a little part maybe up above the list or maybe below the list 
where it actually lists the number of items in the list. Right? And, um, and so if you compare those two, they're not always the same. And that's a good sign that you have trouble. Right? Second responsibility of the container class is to uh, uh, provide access to items in the list. And there's two ways we can provide access to items in a list. The first way is we can provide sequential access to items by, uh, by uh, providing an iterator. I think everybody's pretty familiar with the iterator pattern, but we'll go over it uh, just, for, uh, just for those who are not. So iterators allow users to uh, get sequential access to elements in a, in a uh, collection of items without having to know anything about the, the structure of the element or the structure of the collection. So a lot of languages actually provide a way to create iterators in them. In Python, you can use the uh, iterator protocol. And the iterator protocol in Python just asks that uh, you create a method called iter, and uh, that returns back what is referred to as an iterable object. Now in Python, an iterable object just means that you have a method called next. And the next method, uh, every time you call the next method, it returns back to you the, uh, the, element, the next element in the collection. In our implementation here, we keep track of, uh, of the current item. And every time we call next, we increment the current item by one. And then we do a search to, uh, uh, to uh, retrieve that item in the list. And then when we're finished iterating through the list, we raise a stop iteration um, exception. Question? This is, uh, I guess this, the iterator will not provide you with a random search, but we will talk about uh, different ways that you can, uh, I guess, uh, pseudo-randomly search through the list. All right. All right, so the next topic is, uh, is non-sequential access to the list. And by non-sequential, I mean that we can uh, search for items by position, where we can say, uh, give me the fifth element in the list. And so this serves to your, your question about uh, random access to items in the list. Say again. No, but that is, something, that is something that you can implement in the pattern, right? So this is, the pattern is kind of general, so you can add in your own uh, methods for, uh, for, uh, it, for searching for items, right? And so being able to search for items by, uh, by some kind of string is, uh, it's kind of touching on the next topic, which is uh, searching by property, right? So we can say that uh, an item has some kind of value, and uh, we want to search for, uh, for Items that have um, uh, items that match a, a certain property, in, match a value with a property. Right? So along the way in this container class, we never actually talk about uh, in this abstract container class. We never actually talk about uh, what the item looks like. We only describe. We only say that there is an item object out there and the container is just responsible for returning that item object. And uh, the reason we do this is because uh, the item that's gonna be returned is really specific to the container that is, uh, that is, uh, is specific to the implementation of the container class. So what I mean by that is that if we're searching on eBay in, a, in an eBay list or an eBay container, then we're gonna wanna return back an item that is an eBay list item. Right? If we're searching on Amazon and we, uh, we get back lists of items, we want to return back an Amazon list item. And the same goes for the Hub Zero websites where I work. We search for support tickets or resources. We return back uh, a list that matches the container. Right? And so when we have this kind of situation where we can't describe the actual uh, object that we want to create inside of our concrete or inside of our abstract class, we should start thinking about using the factory method pattern. So the factory method pattern uh, describes a way where we can define an interface for creating objects without actually defining which class is going to be instantiated. Right? We leave that up to the subclasses of our abstract class. So for example, in our container, in our abstract container object, 
all we can do is define that uh, there is an item class and uh, that that item class takes some arguments. And then in our get item by position function, or our factory method, we actually instantiate uh, whatever the item class is. If you leave it blank and it ends up being none, then you get a none object. But uh, whatever that item class is, we instantiate that with a set of arguments that were provided to us by, our, uh, by the subclass of our container. And we also give it an item number. So what this means for the implementation is that inside of our, abs inside of our concrete class, uh, in this example, tools list class, we have to set uh, the value for an item class. We have to describe what kind of item we want returned back to the user. And in this case, we're going to return back a tools item, item object. right? And the tools item object is just uh, a, uh, a subclass of the regular item uh, class. All right, so we kind of covered the container, how a container works. Uh, let's move on to talk about how an item object works. So if you remember in the beginning, we had four things that we wanted our item object to be able to do. The first thing we wanted the item object to be able to do was uh, represent a single item in the list. Right? And we can achieve this by uh, just associating some kind of numeric value with our item object. Next, we wanted uh, item objects to be able to uh, be updated dynamically. Right? And so uh, this is where we start to run into a little bit of trouble. Inside of our uh, page object, we're used to sending locators that are hard-coded. Right? So, we may have a, a whole dictionary of locators, and uh, we hard code each string in here. If we wanted to refer to the first, the, uh, the first item in this list, we would hard code a one into our locators. And if we wanted to refer to the second item in the list, we would hard code a two into our locators. But the problem is that this doesn't match up with what we wanted in the beginning. We wanted not to have to uh, create an, an an object for every item in the list. That makes our automation script slow. Right? What we'd really be interested in is if we can somehow figure out a way to just put like an n value in here. And then later on, we can uh, substitute in a value of our choice to, uh, that, that is linked to which item in the list we want to represent. So that's the idea behind a concept called template locators. I first learned about template locators from uh, developer Adam Goucher of element34.ca. And he had a video online where he described that you can hand your page object a string with a template inside of it as the locator. Now, of course, this is an invalid locator, right? But whenever you want to use your locator, all you have to do is format that string with, uh, with, the, uh, with the values that you're interested in putting in there and then you get a valid locator. So we can apply this to, uh, to our item object. Instead of passing in an, a locator dictionary with hard-coded locators in there, what we really want to do is pass in a template, a dictionary of locator templates. Right? And then anytime we want to update which item our object points to, we can call this update item number. We give it an item number, and then that item number is uh, substituted into uh, the templates, our locator templates, and we get uh, new locators that represent our object. All right, the next, two, uh, the next two parts cannot be implemented inside of our abstract uh, item class because they're specific to the type of object that we're creating. The third piece of uh, the third requirement we had for our item objects was that we wanted our item objects to have some kind of value. Right? So our usual interface for uh, for doing things, we we uh, if we have a, a checkbox on a web page, then we would call uh, the find element uh, by ID or whatever your locator style is, and uh, then we would ask if we wanted to get the value of that of that, uh, ele that HTML element, then we would ask, you know, is it selected or, 
Or if it's a text box, we would ask for the text or something like that. And uh, instead of doing that, we should be thinking about uh, using uh, page objects that are a little bit lower level. So if you have a checkbox on a page, then you should create a page object that represents the text box and then knows how to set and get the value of that text, of that text box or checkbox or whatever. So similarly, for, uh, if we wanted to set the value, uh, we could use uh, an accessor function uh, to, uh, or a property to, uh, to set the value of our checkbox. Right? This same idea applies to uh, items in a list. Right? So uh, in, the, in the previous case, we were working with very simple um, uh, page object uh, that represented a checkbox. But if you have an item in a list, you may have an aggregate of page objects. And so we would still like to be able to say, what is the value of this, uh, list, uh, of this list item? And uh, the easiest way for me to think about the value of the list item is just to summarize all of the pieces of the list, all the readable data within the list in a dictionary, and call those properties of that list item. So what we have here is a, uh, a function we call value. It's just a, a simple getter function. And uh, we fill it with, uh, with uh, the different elements that are inside of our list item. So in a tools item list item, we may have a title, some details, and an alias that all represent properties of the tool that is being represented by that list item. And uh, we can just uh, go ahead and grab the values of, uh, so for links, we just want the link text. And for uh, details, details is a text, uh, a text uh, probably like a read-only text field or something, and we'll just uh, get the value of that text field. So this kind of function is actually used when we do searching. Uh, if we search by property, we would be able to uh, say we want a list item where uh, the title is equal to X. Or if you say, you know, it starts with this, then if it starts with a particular letter, you can say your title, you could write a function that says your title starts with this particular letter, right? So all, I'm a big advocate of, uh, of, of nearly all page objects uh, being able to say, this is my value, or, or, um, or having a, a setter function to say, set this as my value, because it really makes your automation scripts uh, easier to use. All right, the last piece for the item class is that we want to be able to interact with the item, right? And this is only natural. I mean, this is the reason why we build page objects. Um, page objects represent a, uh, a piece of a web page, and, uh, and it uh, provides access to the services of that web page. So if we, have, uh, if we have links on our web page, it's only natural for us to want to actually click on those links or go somewhere, right? So we can provide little uh, helper functions in order, to, uh, in order to expose the service of clicking on that link. All right, so that's the basics of the item list pattern. Uh, we, uh, of course, the original problem that we were trying to solve was that uh, we don't know how many items actually come back in a list, right? And we were able to solve that by one, not hard coding our locators, use the locator templates. Uh, two, uh, don't pre-allocate your elements, right? Use something like the factory method pattern to uh, allow you to get elements on demand. Uh, three, we wanted easy access to our, uh, we wanted easy access to the elements in our list, and so uh, we used, uh, uh, we used, uh, we allowed uh, objects to be updatable. So uh, the last two, we wanted to be able to access items in the list, so we provided an iterator for sequential access, and then we also provided some search functions for uh, non-sequential access. All right, so another uh, area where I found it uh, difficult to kind of, uh, uh, I found difficulties with dealing with, uh, with building page objects is iframes, right? So in iframes, uh, I guess we'll start off with uh, the motivation, which is uh, on, the, on the Hub Zero websites, uh, we ask users to uh, upload data and contribute resources to our website. That's the only way our websites can uh, continue to grow as if we have user participation. 
And as part of the process of uploading a resource, we, have to, uh, we ask the users to describe the type of resource that they're uploading. And so this is a field from the web form that, uh, that where we ask the user to describe, um, to describe what resource they're actually uploading. And the field, uh, this, this particular one is just a simple text area field. It was very easy for me to write a page object for it. And uh, I was happy when I got it done like five minutes later. All right, so uh, recently our web developers uh, started adding uh, a more complicated uh, field in order to allow people to upload uh, or describe the resources that they're uploading. Right? Uh, this is using a CK editor. For those of you familiar with CK editor, uh, it actually runs inside of an iframe. And uh, I thought that uh, when I first saw this, I said, hey, this is wonderful because it allows our users to uh, add rich text to their, uh, their descriptions. And uh, then when I started looking deeper into it, I realized, oh man, this thing's running in an iframe. So uh, the, the least amount of work I'm gonna have to do is to build another page object to deal with uh, getting into the iframe and, and, um, and manipulating this, this widget. But then I realized uh, that once I was inside the iframe, I could use the same page object as, my, uh, as I was using before in my text area. Right? And so that started getting me thinking, do I really have to build another page object if I already have one that works, except for the fact that I need to be inside of a uh, iframe? So before we tackle that question, let's just review how iframes work. This is a web page that has uh, two different iframes and three different input fields. The first, uh, the, the HTML for this, uh, for this web page is uh, listed down here. And you can see that it has two, uh, two items in, the, in these, the two items in this HTML page. The first item is an input field, I0. And it is, uh, we can, it is located in something that we consider or we call the default context, right? This is where we work all the time when we're in Selenium. We're working inside the default context. We're not inside of any frames. Everything is good when you're searching for elements, right? The next item in this uh, web page is, uh, is an iframe. And the iframe is called frame one, and uh, it sources this, web, uh, this HTML page, innerpage.html. And uh, the basic way iframes work is that they just refer to another HTML page, and then they load that up into a frame, right? So if we take a look at uh, innerpage.html, we see that it too has two items in it, right? So it has a, an input field, i1, and i1 is considered, loc it's considered uh, to be uh, inside of the, uh, the frame one context. So that means that, in order to work with it, we have to actually traverse an iframe in order to get into it. The other element inside of this web page is another iframe, right? Who does two iframes like embedded within each other? I've seen it on some of our websites. So, um, so it has another iframe. And its its uh, ID is frame two, and it sources a web page called anotherpage.html, right? So if we look inside the source of that, we see that there is an input field in there, and it is within the, the frame two context, right? And don't forget, frame two context is within the frame one context, right? So we have quite a conundrum here. We have to figure out how to, uh, how to operate uh, this I2 object uh, through all of these iframes. So if we wanted to build a page object for uh, I0, uh, very simple, we probably have a couple of uh, getter and setter functions. I like to use uh, the function value for my getter and setter function, so, um, so then I can just say uh, element.value and either get it or set it. Uh, we might also have another function for appending, and the append function does everything, well, it does, uh, it, it just writes uh, values to the uh, item. It doesn't clear it out or anything, so sometimes that's convenient. All right, nothing special about building a page object for I, I0. Don't have to switch any context. When we get into uh, the 
when we get into working with the I1 object, uh, we can use a text input uh, object, but we're going to call it text one frame, right? So this is a page object that gets us into one frame, right? One iframe. And you'll see here that there are, uh, there's a little bit of extra code added here. So the first thing we do is we uh, find the frame one element inside of our HTML DOM, and then we uh, call switch to frame, right? So we have to traverse the frame in order to get into our uh, into the right context, and then we can operate, we can run our same three functions, uh, find the element, clear it, send keys. Uh, that's kind of our core, our core uh, setter function. And then the last thing we want to do is switch back to the iframe, or switch back to the default context. Because context. if you don't switch back to the default context, then everything you search for afterwards is going to fail, unless it's also within the, uh, the uh, frame one context. So we actually have to do this for all of our functions. And I didn't have enough room on my slides to write all this out. So I just put dot, dot, dot here. And uh, you can imagine what the other functions look like. All right. On to object I2, which I remind you is in two different iframes. Right? So if we look at our setter method, we uh, first traverse frame one, same way we did in the, uh, for the I1 object. But then we do it again. We traverse frame two. And then we uh, run our core bit of uh, uh, our core actions. And then we switch back to the default content. Right? So we could go on and on with this. right? If you have three frames, four frames, nobody wants to build page objects where all they're doing is copying the original page object and then keep adding in all of these uh, iframes. That's not the way I like to spend my Saturday afternoon. Right? So, just to summarize, when you're dealing with iframes, you have to enter and exit the context before you, uh, or enter the context before you uh, work with the, um, before you work with the item. And then you have to exit the context afterwards. Uh, if you have page objects, you probably have to, uh, you probably have to manipulate all the, all the methods in your page objects. And the question still remains, do we have to create new page objects, really? I mean, what, we, what we're really interested in doing is having a, uh, a simple function that works when there's no iframes and performs the core actions. And then if we, uh, if we come across the same, ob or the same uh, page object within an iframe, we just want to wrap that one simple uh, core function with some code that will enter the iframe, run the function, and then exit the iframe. And if we have to do it twice, we just wrap it again, right? So we enter the, frame, the first frame, we then enter the second frame, we run our core actions, we exit the second frame, then exit the first frame. Right? That's what we're really interested in. And that's the idea behind the iframe wrap design pattern. So the iframe wrap design pattern uh, allows us to uh, use old page objects, so we're getting some code reuse out of this, it allows us to use our old page objects uh, inside, of, uh, inside of iframes just by simply wrapping all the, all the uh, methods. Oh, by the way, it uses the decorator design pattern in order to accomplish this. So anybody not familiar with the uh, decorator design pattern, uh, uh, the main goal is to attach additional responsibility onto an object, usually dynamically, um, and without changing the interface of that object. So we usually see this being applied at runtime. This is not something you, you tend to do before, uh, before you build your object. Um, the, main, uh, the main advantage of uh, doing something like the decorator pattern is that uh, you, can, uh, you can change a single object. You don't have to change uh, the class where it will actually change all of the objects of that class. You can work with a single object and just change that one object. So if we had a, uh, uh, an object, little a, and it instantiated the class uh, big A, and it has a, um, an attribute called f that points to some kind of function, if we wanted to wrap this page object, or this, I guess it's just an object, if we want to wrap this object, what we would do is we would, uh, we would first build some kind of wrapper function, and we would uh, break the, the, uh, the connection between our attribute f and the function object, 
and then reassociate our attribute f with the wrapper function and let the wrapper function call uh, our original function, right? So it's a little bit of uh, software wizardry going on here. We can apply this to our, uh, to our, our uh, text page object, right? So uh, similarly, we have a, a, a page object that represents the I front, I1 object, the first input, input in the, um, the frame one context. If it has a value attribute that points to a function, what we can do is, uh, is create a wrapper function around that that will eventually call our function. And this wrapper function takes care of getting into uh, iframe context and exiting the iframe context. And then we, uh, we kill the association between our value attribute and our function and replace it with an association between our value attribute and our wrapper function. So how do you create decorated page objects? Uh, the first thing you have to do is uh, you call a function something like iframe wrap. Right? And the iframe wrap uh, uh, function takes in two parameters. The first parameter is the object that you're interested in wrapping. And the second parameter is just a list of frames that you have to go through before you actually get into uh, where you can operate in, uh, with, that, uh, with the page object. So uh, for our I0 object, we don't have any, any uh, frames, so we don't need to wrap it. For our I1 object, uh, we want to create an, a page object called text, and uh, we have to traverse one frame in order to uh, work with that page object. And for I2, we create an object, a text object, and we have to create two frames. So first we have to traverse the I1 frame, and then second we have to traverse the uh, the the frame two. All right, so uh, within the iframe wrap uh, method, it uh, instantiates an object called iframe tracker. And the main purpose of iframe tracker is just to uh, help us with getting into and out of iframes. Uh, there are two functions in here that are uh, pretty interesting. The uh, first function is a method called uh, wrap callable attributes. So the purpose of wrap callable attributes is to uh, figure out which attributes inside of our page object are actually callable or, or methods, and then, uh, and then it wraps those attributes. So inside of Python, all of the, uh, all of the uh, there's, there's actually a lot of attributes inside of your object, and some of them are data members, some of them are, uh, are callable attributes or functions. So it accepts a page object as, as its uh, O parameter here, and then it just goes through the class, looks for callable attributes, and then once it finds one, it, uh, it uh, calls this other method called wrap attribute. So a wrap, the wrap attribute method uh, uh, performs uh, the actual wrapping. It creates a wrapper function. So the first thing it does is it switches into the appropriate iframe context. We've actually calculated which frame level we should be in uh, up above. And then uh, it calls your, your, uh, your method, your original method, and then it switches back out of your iframe context. So you can already see that this is, uh, this is uh, very similar to the code that we had to write manually when we were building page objects uh, to represent objects inside of iframes. All right, lastly, I guess uh, let me note one more thing. This wrap attribute method actually returns the wrapper function, right? And so once we get that wrapper function back, we can start uh, messing around with the, uh, where this value attribute actually points to. We uh, set the value attribute to point to our wrapper function and not our original function. Our original function will be called by our wrapper function. All right, so now how do you use the iframe uh, uh, an iframe wrapped I object? Well, the answer is that you use it the exact same way you use uh, a non iframe wrapped object. So the decorator pattern uh, describes a way that we can uh, uh, decorate methods of an object without uh, changing its interface. Right? So uh, the way that we operate uh, within, the way that we would, uh, the same way that we would ask for the value of an I0 or or the input, uh, 
the input field that is in the default context just by asking for its value is the same way that we would uh, operate the same way that we would ask for a uh, the value of a page object that has been wrapped inside of uh, uh, inside of that has been wrapped by iframes. So when you call these methods, the the value method on i objects i1 and i2, uh, the code automatically because we've wrapped these uh, methods with uh, code to get into and out of the iframe, it automatically traverses the iframe and then grabs the value and then returns you back to the default context. So the same thing happens with, uh, with your uh, setter functions. You can set a value, it will go through, traverse the iframes, set the value of the underlying HTML element, and then return you back to the, uh, the default context. All right, so uh, just to summarize the iframe wrap pattern, uh, iframe wrap pattern lets you, uh, lets you take an HTML, a page object that represents an HTML element and, uh, and use it whether it is, uh, I guess it allows you to, uh, to use the same object that you would have used outside of an iframe. You can just wrap the attributes and uh, use it inside of your iframe. Also, uh, it uses the decorator pattern in order to accomplish all the wrapping. So one more thing about iframes, there are actually a couple of gotchas. Right? So uh, no pattern is complete without gotchas. So the first gotcha is that uh, uh, not all your page object attributes need to be wrapped. Right? Things like your constructor don't have to wrap it. So you should keep a list, if you're going to use this pattern, you should keep a list of uh, what attributes don't have to be wrapped. The majority of them may have to be wrapped, but uh, you don't want to wrap object uh, methods that don't have to be wrapped because your code will stop working. The second thing is that uh, in Python, if you have properties, uh, properties are just accessors, getter, setter, delete kind of thing, functions. Uh, if you have properties, uh, it's tricky to wrap them because uh, in Python, the properties are associated with the class object and not with the instance of the class, right? So that means that if you want to wrap a property in Python, you have to first create a new class that's a copy of your uh, original class, and then you wrap the properties of your new class, and then you associate your new class with your page object. Right? So it gets a little tricky when you're dealing with properties. I found that one out the hard way, so pro tip. All right. So if you're uh, interested in learning more about uh, design patterns, uh, there's an excellent book out there called Design Patterns. It's written by this group of guys called the Gang of Four. I think it's uh, Gamma is the first author. They usually just call it Gamma et al. Right? Uh, there's uh, two websites that I use a lot uh, when I'm uh, interested in learning about uh, design patterns, uh, oodesign.com and uh, sourcemaking.com. And then uh, I guess I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, my team members back, in, back at Purdue University who have uh, supported me as I've uh, kind of come up with these, uh, these different ways of uh, building page objects. And my advisor in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, uh, Sam Midkiff, who has also helped me kind of flush out uh, these different design patterns. So there's one design pattern we didn't get to talk about, and I, I feel like we're going to run out of time if we if we actually get into it. It's called the web form pattern. And uh, it takes some of the ideas from these other patterns, but it really uh, promotes a way of, of filling out web forms where instead of, uh, instead of actually, uh, well, let me uh, see if we can, get to, maybe we can get to some of the slides. Uh, there's a good slide. Instead of uh, building page objects uh, for a web form, where you, uh, you hand uh, values, uh, where you have a function like submit ticket. This is, by the way, a, a form for a support ticket. And uh, you can fill out this form. Uh, when we build a page object, sometimes I see people with, uh, with a method called like sub, uh, submit ticket, right? And then you, you enter in all of the uh, values you want in the form. You just put them as parameters. And instead of doing this type of interface, I try to promote an interface where 
Uh, you just uh, shove all of your inputs to your form into a dictionary and hand it to a, fee, a, a function like uh, populate form. And populate form takes care of parsing the dictionary, figuring out that these are actually uh, fields in your page, and these are the values that you want put into the page. And, uh, and then you can, uh, can kind of sum it all up with this, or, or finish it all up with a submit form method. Right? So I'll be around after if you guys want to talk about that. Right now, I, wanna, I want to uh, open the floor up to questions that people have uh, regarding the other two design patterns. Any questions? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so the question was, are there any suggestions for how to create di uh, objects dynamically in other languages like uh, Java? Um, I'm not very familiar with Java. My feeling is that uh, because Python and Java are, are kind of similar in their, in their object orientedness, that uh, a lot of these design patterns will actually translate over uh, to Java. So I believe the, uh, a lot of these design patterns were first explained in either Smalltalk or C++. And so, um, so uh, but I can't, I can't speak to the specifics of how to uh, dynamically, dynamically create objects um, in Java. My guess is that there would be some kind of way of, I mean, we were talking about the item list pattern. We were talking about dynamically creating our objects. So my guess is that there would be some kind of way to say that, uh, that you have a class and you just keep the name of the class and then instantiate that uh, without like physically writing out the name of the class by storing that name in a variable or a reference to the object that represents that class. So. Okay. Okay. So I'll have to look up reflection too because uh, I saw that in when I was reading about design patterns. I saw the word reflection. I wasn't really familiar with uh, all the details around it. So I'll have to look that up as well. Other questions? All right. Well, if you guys ever want to get in contact with me, the email is telldsk if you have anything to tell me. Telldsk at Gmail. Um, and uh, I'll be roaming around here, and uh, you guys can come up and ask questions or whatever. So. Yeah, let's go. Maybe it's quicker to uh, do this. Oh, there we go. Tell DSK at gmail.com. All right. Thank you for your time. <laughs>